Up until this point, we have been designing logic that has no memory. But now that we know how to make a memory cell, we can put memory or add memory to our circuits. And what we do whenever we're adding memory to our circuits is creating a state machine. Now, a state machine is basically logic with memory. I mean, yes, it's a bit more than that, but it's really just adding memory to our logic circuits in order to create kind of this, this machine that not only can process things, but can remember where it's been, have kind of a history of all the states that has gone through. You know, your code, if you write any sort of code, your code is really a state machine. Um, you know, think of a for loop. A for loop has this, this, this counter, right? So if you, if you did something like for, i equals zero, i less than 10, i plus plus. That's supposed to be an i, not a t. That was turning into a plus. Sorry about that. All right. Now, as you go through this code, you have a state for this particular loop. And the state is what value i is. You know, are we going through it for the first time, i equals zero? Are we going through it one of the intermediate times, i equals five? Or are we doing it at the last time, i equals nine? You know, all of those things, you know, you, you, and you start expanding out from that, all of your variables have some sort of a condition. You can see the condition of your program by the state of the variables, the values stored in the variables. There's actually another thing that we haven't talked about yet that identifies the state of the machine, as, and that is which instruction are we currently executing? Turns out there is a memory location that remembers what the current instruction is that we're executing. Depending on whether you're working, depending on which architecture you're working with, you know, some architectures call it a program counter, some call it an, call it an instruction pointer, same thing. It's a thing in memory that identifies which instruction we are currently executing. So, which instruction are we currently executing? What are all the values in our program? Those are state. And so our code is really a state machine. Now the state machines we're gonna be designing in this next couple of lessons are a lot simpler than code. I mean, we're really gonna have very small variables, variables that maybe have two or three bits. Um, and if you think about it, if you have two bits, how many possible combinations of ones and zeros can you have with two bits? Well, there's zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, four, right? And so our system can take on four states. Now, let's talk a little bit about the design of our state machine. Now, the very first thing that we're gonna do is we're going to do a system level design. And what that's gonna mean is we're gonna take a look from like high up, you know, a block diagram for our system. You know, what are the inputs to our system? What are the outputs we expect from the system? And once you've got a good idea of the operation from that level, you can do something called a state diagram. So we're gonna design a state diagram. Now, if you have any experience with something called graph theory, it's a branch of mathematics, there is something called a directed graph. And we're gonna talk a little bit about, and I'll show you exactly how to make it. A directed graph is really just, well, okay, I start with this condition or this state, and then I can go or follow these lines, they're called edges, and they take me to a different state, and these are called vertices. So a vertex follows a, an edge to a new vertex, follows an edge to a new vertex. May seem a little overwhelming right now, but if you've had graph theory, you know what I'm talking about. We will, however, start from scratch in designing a state, uh, state diagram. The third step, and the third step is really a simple step. It's almost trivial, but it has a great deal of, it, well, first of all, it has uh, it's, it's necessary for us to design the logic, but it also actually has an effect on how simple or complex the logic is that we design for this. What we're gonna do is we're gonna assign numbers, in other words, we're gonna number to the states. Now, 
Think about it this way. Maybe that my system, maybe my system has five states, five states. There are five conditions that our, our system will pass through in order to make a state in order to make a state machine, make the logic for this, I have to give each one of those states a number. And so you would start numbering it zero because all good engineers start counting from zero, remember? So zero, one, two, three, four. And by assigning numbers to those states, I can actually give the logic something to hang on to, something to, some, some values to assign or read in order to do their processing. So once we do that, once we've finished assigning numbers, then what we're going to do is we're going to create truth tables. We're going to create truth tables by looking at the numbers we have assigned to our states and following how they went through the truth table and, and excuse me, how they went through the state diagram. So if we're going from this state to this state, if we're going from this state to this state, or based on this condition, what's our output supposed to be? Once we give numbers to our states, we can create truth tables in order to design the logic. And how do we design the logic? Remember, we're going to do sum of products expressions. So these are all going to be done with Carnal maps. All right, there you go. Now, we're going to go through, well, we're going to go through a simple example first in order to kind of get an idea for what it means to go through each one of these, these steps. But then we're going to start designing state machines, well, with a little bit more detail in our steps. Now, to define what it means for each one of these steps, I'm going to use an example. Now, to begin with, we are going to do system level design. That was our first step, right? And so system level design. The system we are going to design is, well, it's going to be a trivial traffic signal system. So imagine that I have an intersection. Now, the intersection has a very busy north-south path. So I've got cars coming down north and south. That's the main thoroughfare. But I've got a side street. And you got to let these cars out of the side street. And that side street is going to be my east-west path. All right. Now, in order to get our east-west path access to the north-south, I'm just going to leave it green. I'm just going to let cars flow north and south until we detect that somebody has appeared on the east-west on the east-west road. Now, there's a couple of things that we could do. One of the things that we could do, an old design, is you may have seen these little cuts in the pavement that look like, um, it, it looks like somebody cut this little octagon on the pavement, this long rectangle with these beveled corners. Well, that's actually something called an inductance loop, and, and it uses the principles of electricity to determine when a large piece of metal is sitting on top of that inductance loop. Um, the only way an inductance, inductance where a loop works is if the vehicle is parked directly over it or, you know, has a significant amount of metal over that inductance loop. Unfortunately, that doesn't give you any ability to predict, unless you put a whole bunch of inductance loops, it doesn't give you any ability to predict how many cars are there or if a car is coming and so forth. So you may have seen more recently, if you're looking at, and this is kind of looking at the the boom all over the, the road. You may have the traffic signals hanging off of this boom over the road. And you may have seen a small camera sticking off the top of that boom. That camera uses edge detection and other AI type principles in order to detect when a car is coming. And they can actually look way down the road and be able to see when cars are coming. Whatever you use, we need to have something on the east-west path that is identifying when a car is approaching, how close it is. Um, or, or, or basically that it's there and it's going to need to be able to go through the, go through the intersection. So, um, now this is not actually going to be the input to our system. Understand that if you make too many inputs to our system, it's going to make this state diagram really complicated. And for a first time out, we should probably do something simple. So what instead we're going to do is we're going to have this top level system. We're going to have an input and it's going to be T. Now let me tell you what T is. 
T is actually a timer. And there are a couple of things, first of all, well, let's, let's put it this way. T is going to be a binary input. And so T is un, in identifying whether that timer is running or not. So T equals zero means timer is not running. And when I say timer is not running, I mean it's expired. It's counted all the way down to zero and it stopped running, okay? Now, T equals one means the timer is running. In other words, we've loaded a value into the timer and it's ticking down, it's ticking down, it's ticking down. And it will stay one, this t equals one input to our system. We'll just simply say, hey, we're still counting, we're still counting, we're still counting. When we get down to the all zeros, the timer stops and this t input to our system equals zero. Now, there are three things that are going to start this timer. The first thing that's going to start the timer. So the timer starts when east-west car is detected. All right. So that's the, that's the first thing. So right now, you know, there, there's no car on the east-west. North-south is just going like crazy. And uh, so the timer is, is expired. It's not running. T is equal to zero. And as long as T equals zero, you want to keep the cars going north and south. Now, for the second and third, things that are going to uh, going to do this timer is that once a car and and by the way this timer running once the once the timer starts what you're going to do as soon as a car is detected there's actually two things we're going to do as soon as a car is detected here you're going to not only start the timer but you're going to make yellow on north south this is a very simple traffic signal system. So two things are going to happen when a car appears. So whether the camera or the loop detects it, two things are going to happen. Timer is going to start running and we're going to get yellow for north-south. Now, once that timer expires, what we're going to do is we're going to give green to east-west and red to north-south. The second thing that the timer is going to do is it's going to time east west green so we're going to also as soon as it turns green we're going to start the timer again and it's going to simply count down and say okay we're going to leave it green for this many seconds once it reaches zero we're going to do what we're going to make east west yellow and that will make it so that the the the, the cars will slow down hopefully on east-west so that we can eventually turn it red and give green to north-south. So we're going to time east-west green and we're going to time east-west yellow. So those two things, well, those two things are going to be how much time we're going to give the lights there. All right. So system works like this. East, north-south, green. Every, the timer's not running, green. A car appears. Two things happen. Timer starts and yellow is going to be on north-south. And so whenever I say timer starts when east-west car detected, that timer is the amount of time you're going to give north-south yellow, all right? Now when that timer expires to zero, north-south is gonna go red, east-west is gonna get green. And so east-west will start flowing. But the timer is gonna get loaded again in order to start how much time we're going to give east-west green and how much time north-south is going to be stopped for green on east-west. Then, then once that timer expires, we're going to go to red on east-west. Oh, no, excuse me. Yeah, we're going, sorry. We're going to go to green. We're going to go, let me try this one more time. We're going to go from green to yellow and the timer is going to get loaded with how much time we want to give yellow here. Once that timer expires, east-west is going to get red, north-south is going to go back to green. All right? So that is our input. A little bit more complicated than I wanted to get, but I also wanted a system that just had one input. And so that timer is going to be my one input. All right? Now, what about the outputs from my system? Well, think about a traffic signal system. What are the outputs? Well, they're lights, right? So we are going to have three outputs red, yellow, and green for the north-south direction. And then we're gonna have three outputs, red, yellow, and green for the east, 
east-west outputs, right? Or for the east-west traffic, all right? So there is our system level design. Our system level design is this box right here. And this box is basically saying we have one input, we have six outputs, and inside the box, that's where we're gonna put our state machine. All right, now step two was design the state diagram. All right, now, real quick, if you haven't had any experience with graph theory, and if you don't know what a directed graph is, it's not too bad, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Basically, what you've got are vertices, which are these little circles. And inside the circle, we've got an identifier which says what that vertice or what that state, this is gonna be our state, represents. So we have a state and inside is a description, all right? Now coming out of that, going to other states are these edges or these, 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 these transitions that go from one state to the other state. Now associated with them is the condition that takes us from one state to the next state. So let's go ahead and design a state diagram that shows exactly how our traffic signal is supposed to work. Now we're gonna start out with the default situation. And, and think about it this way. If power went out and we had some sort of a reset, where would you like the system to start? Now, whenever it comes to traffic signals, if the power goes out and it comes back up, you basically do flashing yellow in one direction and flashing red in the other direction. You don't want to have some sort of confusion. That's always what they come up with whenever uh, the state they come up in. But we're going to assume ours comes up with north-south enabled or north-south, you know, the, 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 the north-south traffic gets green and the east-west gets red. So our first state is going to be north-south is green and east-west is red, right? All right. Now, this actually tells us what the outputs are. If you think about our state machine that I've unfortunately erased here, I had those six outputs. The red, green, the red yellow, and green for north-south, and the red, yellow, and green for east-west. This actually tells us exactly what our system is, is doing, the outputs. So north-south, green is on, but red and yellow are off. This one, east-west, red is on, but yellow and green are off, all right? Now, as long as the timer isn't, excuse me, yeah, as long as the timer is not running, as long as the timer is decremented all the way to zero and is staying there, and remember, T equals zero for that condition, as long as that's the case, we want to stay in the same state. So, so just think about it this way. It just, just as long as north-south is green and east-west, excuse me, as long as the timer's not running, we want to keep north-south green and east-west red. So we're just going to stay in this state. Now, what dictates a state transition or moving from one state to another? Well, we are going to need memory in order to remember our state. What's memory? Well, remember those little single-bit memory cells? Things called latches or flip-flops, right? Well, we're gonna use a flip-flop to do this. And so to move from one state to the next state means storing new things inside the flip-flops. And what stores something new inside the flip-flop? A clock. And so there's just gonna be this clock. And the clock is just simply saying, check to see if we need to go to a new state, check to see if we need to go to a new state. And so if we're in this state and you get a clock pulse and T equals zero, the new state is going to be the same state. It's not going to move, but you need to load something new into those memory locations. So you're just going to keep clocking in whatever number it is in our memory devices that represents north-south green, east-west red. Now, assume a car has appeared and it starts the timer. Well, if it starts the timer, where do we want to go? Well, we want to turn on north-south yellow, turn off north-south green, but leave east-west red on. So we're gonna create another state here, and this one is gonna be north-south yellow, east-west still red. And that occurs 
whenever the timer equals one or when the timer is counting, right? And so that clock is just ticking away, just ticking away. And we're still in this state because t equals zero. A car appears, t equals one now. And we move to this state where we just set north, south equal to yellow and east, west equal to green, red. Now, something important to look at in this case, how many values can t take on? The one input into our system, how many values can it take on? Well, zero or one, right? Two. So we need to have one, two arrows coming out of this guy. It's called an out count in graph theory, basically saying I have an out count, out the, the, the number of directed arrows coming out of that vertex is equal to two. All right. We also are going to need to have two, an out count of two coming out of this guy too. We need to have the out for t equals zero and the out for t equals one. Now, what does t equals zero mean whenever we are in north, south, yellow, east, west, red? That means that the timer, which started when a car appeared, has counted all the way to zero. And since it's counted all the way to zero, that means we've left enough, enough time for the north-south yellow, and we need to now make it green on east-west. So we need a new state. We need north-south red, east-west, uh, <laughs> east-west, let's try this around, green, and that happens when t equals zero. All right, there you go. Now, we've got our one of our conditions coming out of this state. We need our second condition coming out of that state. And that second condition is when t equals one, right? So when t equals one, what do we wanna do? Well, t equals one means we're just gonna continue to output yellow on north-south, right? So t equals one. We're gonna output, continue to output. Let's see if I can make that look a little bit more like a t. We're gonna to continue to output yellow on north-south, red on east-west. So we've got an out count of two coming from this state. So I know now what happens, you know, we start out in our initial state, t equals zero, we go to t equals one whenever a car appears. As long as we wanna display yellow on north-south, we keep in this state. And then as soon as we're done displaying yellow on north-south, we come down here where we display red on north-south, east-west green. Now, I've got a, another state here that needs an out count of two, all right? Now, what happens? Well, if, if the, one, remember the second thing that made the timer start was when we started displaying a green on east-west. So the timer started again just by moving to this state. Now the timer circuitry is gonna be a little complicated, but we're not gonna worry about it now. Just assume that as soon as we move to this state, timer started again. As long as that timer is running, t equals one, we're gonna to continue to display the green. But remember, it's counting down this time, not timing how much time we have for yellow, but how much time we have for green on east-west. Once it reaches zero, what do we want to do? Well, we want to output yellow on east-west and red on north-south. So we have another state, north-south, red, east-west, yellow. And we get there when the timer runs out, when t equals zero. All right. So I've got my out count of two. I've got my out count of two. I've got my out count of two, but I've got a new state. I need an out count of two for that guy too. Now, remember, when we come over here, we start the timer again because we want to time how much time east-west gets ye yellow before we go to north-south getting green. So as long as the timer is running, this new loading of the timer, we're going to stay here. But as soon as it times out, as soon as it, the timer gets all the way to zero and we reach t equals zero, we then want to go back up to green on north-south, red on east-west. And there's our state diagram, a directed graph. Now there's one thing missing from this state diagram, and that thing is, as I told you, whenever we start out, we kind of got to have to go into a default state. That default state we identified as this guy. Now, remember, how do you initialize latches or flip-flops? 
Well, you initialize those with the S bar and R bar. And so whatever value we assign to this state for our little memory devices, what we're gonna do is attach the S bars and the R bars appropriately so that whenever we go into a reset and come back up, we will be brought back to that state. But the diagram needs a way of identifying that. And the way you identify that is to just simply put an edge and identify it as the reset. And by doing that, we know that we know how to hook up S bar and R bar before doing that. All right. The next step we will do is actually really simple. It's just to number the states. We'll number it. All right, let's just do it a simple way. We'll just number it zero, one, two, and three. All right. Remember, start counting from zero. So this is, and let's do this three number the states. All right. Now, by numbering the states, we've actually done two things. One is we've made it so that we have patterns of ones and zeros that identify the logic so that we can move from state to state. But the other thing that we've done is if we look at the largest value right here, which is three, convert it to binary. That's a one, one in base two. It actually tells us how many bits we're going to need for our memory. So I convert all of these into two bits. And now I have my binary representation for all four of those states. And that makes sense. Two bits, four possible patterns of ones and zeros gives me those, the, the way of identifying those four states. So um, start out, just simply number them, pick the largest one, convert it to binary. That's gonna tell us how many bits that we need for this particular system. Now, before we start designing our truth tables, I have to go into a little bit more explanation about these numbers that we assign to our states. Think of it this way. I have a memory that just has two bits, two binary digits in it. And by looking in that memory, I can tell which one of these conditions I'm in. We'll draw this in a circuit diagram in a little while, but right now I want you to see that, well, it's, it's just memory. And I'm gonna give each one of these bits a name. And by naming each one of these bits, I can actually create truth tables that'll generate the, generate the process, the logic that takes us through this process. Now, for each one of these, I'm gonna have the least significant bit here. I'm gonna call this S sub zero. And the most significant bit, I'm gonna call that S sub one. And we'll see real quick how this is going to work by creating the truth table that's gonna generate the outputs. Now, if you remember whenever I did the system level design of this, of this state machine, what I did was to, to have six outputs. The system had six outputs. One for north, south, green, one for north, south, yellow, one for north, south, red. Then we had for east, west, one for east, west, green, one for east, west, yellow, one for east, west, red. So this step is, what are we, what are we up to? Four, design the truth tables. All right, now the first one I'm gonna put right down here and it's gonna be the output truth table. So I'm gonna create something called the output truth table. Now, what we've got here, and, and we'll go into a little bit more description about this in, in the next video, but what we've got here is something called a Moore machine, M-O-O-R-E. And the Moore machine says that I am going to generate the output only from the state. In other words, it's the state that dictates what the output's going to be. There's another type of state machine called a Mealy state machine, and the Mealy actually con considers the input as part of, the, of, of what decides what the output's going to be. But we're going to stick with just the current state. So I have S1 and S0. That is my current state. Now, how many possible patterns of ones and zeros can S1 and S0 take on? Well, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. All right. Now, how does this correspond to generating the outputs? Well, first of all, we have red, north, south, yellow, north, south, and then uh, green, north, south, right? And then we also have the red, east, west, yellow, east, west, 
and green east-west, right? So there are all the possible outputs. And what we can see from this state diagram is how those create an output truth table. So, for example, whenever I'm in state 00, zero that's this top left-hand state right here. I'm in state 00. zero. What, what is, what, what's on and what's off? Well, north-south green is on. East-west red is on but all the other lights are off, all right? Next row, zero, 01. What am I doing with zero, 01? What is the output when I'm in state zero, 01? Well, when I'm in state zero, 01, north, south, yellow is on, east, west, red is still on, everything else is off, all right? State 10. One zero. So if I'm in state one zero, north south red is now on, and east west green is on. So north south red is on, and east west green is on, and everything else is off. Okay. And then in state one one, when I'm in state one one, what is my output? Well, north south red is still on and east-west yellow is on, so there you go. All right. Now, turns out that it should be pretty easy to figure out what logic these different, uh, these different, uh, these different, what logic drives these different outputs. For example, red, north, south. Well, it looks like it's just following S1. Yellow north-south, it's on only when S1 is a zero and S0 is a one. That sounds like S1 bar ended with S0. North-south green, when is it on? Well, only when uh, S1 is zero and S0 is zero. So that sounds like S1 bar ended with S0 bar. Red east-west, that's on only whenever S1 is off. That sounds like S1 bar. East-west yellow. Looks like it's on exactly when both S1 and S0 are equal to 1. So S1 and S0, that'll generate a 1 there. And then lastly, when is green east-west on? Well, that's whenever we have an S1 is 1 and S0 is a uh, 0. So that's S1, S0 bar. So from going through, and, and it's kind of nice because what we did was by creating this state diagram, we were able to go through, enumerate every possible condition so we could generate logic. It helped us organize our thoughts in terms of this pro the process that this, uh, that this traffic signal is going through. That's actually a really good tool, even if you're not going to design the logic, to be able to see how our system is going through every possible state to figure out what the, what, you know, to get a good idea of what the process is. All right. Now, that is just one of the truth tables. Now, in this space right here, I'm going to try and wedge in another truth table. Now, this truth table, you know, the, the, this, the output truth table took care of what our outputs are when we're in each one of the states. The next truth table is going to take care of the edges. And those edges are going to dictate what the next state is. So this is the next state truth table. Now, the next state truth table, that depends on three bits. The first bit it depends on is uh, S1. We have to know S1 and S0, that's the second bit. We have to know S1 and S0 because in order to know what the next state we're going to is, we need to know what the state we're coming from is, right? So. For example, I need to know before I follow this edge that I was in state 0, 0 before I know that a timer equal to 1 is going to take me to state 0, 1, which is the third bit. The third bit we're interested in is the timer bit. So let's go ahead and make this truth table. This truth table, probably see if I can't get this thing wedged in here, it's going to take into account S1, S0, and T. So I need to know the current state, I need to know the input. If I know the current state and the input, I'll know what the next state I'm going to is. And how do I know, how do I represent the next state? Well, the next state is also going to take two bits. And I'm going to represent those two bits with S1 prime and S0 prime. Those primes identifying it as where we're going to, what the next state is. 
All right. Now, I have three bits. How many possible combinations of ones and zeros is that? Eight, right? So I write down all of the possible combinations of ones and zeros for three bits. There you go. And now each one of those rows helps me identify what condition I, I'm, I'm looking at. In fact, in fact, if look at in fact, let's count this. Not, not paying attention to the reset. How many edges do I have up here? I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight, eight edges, right? Eight of those transitions. Each one of those edges corresponds to one of these rows in this truth table. So what does it look like? Well, what we're gonna do is, let's see. Oh, well, let's just start with the truth table. If I'm in state zero, zero, if I'm in state zero, zero, and t equals zero, where am I headed? If I'm in state zero, zero, this state right here, and t equals zero, I'm just coming back to state zero, zero. All right? Now, this next row, row two, if I'm in state zero, zero, and t equals one, if I'm in state zero, zero, and t equals one, I'm headed to state, 0, 1. If I'm in state 0, 1, this state right here, so this row of the truth table says I'm in state 0, 1, t equals 0, where am I headed? Well, if I'm in state 0, 1, and t equals 0, I'm headed down to state 1, 0. The next row of our truth table says if I'm in state 0, 1, and t equals 1, if I'm in state 0, 1 and t equals 1, I'm staying in state 0, 1. Okay. Now, the next row, 1, 0. If I'm in state 1, 0 and t equals 0, if I'm in state 1, 0, this state right here, and t equals 0, I'm headed to state 1, 1. All right. Now, if I'm in state 1, 0, state 1, 0, and t equals 1, I'm staying in state 1, 0. If I'm in state 1, 1, this next row, the seventh row, if I'm in state 1, 1, excuse me, did I say 1, 0? Let me try that again. If I'm in state 1, 1, if I'm in state 1, 1, and t equals 0, t equals 0, I'm headed back up to state 0, 0. And if I'm in state 1, 1 and t equals 1, I'm in state 1, 1 and t equals 1. That's this edge right here. I'm coming back to state 1, 1. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about these two truth tables, the next state truth table and the output truth table, is that they've pretty much digitized our graphic. We don't even need this graphic anymore. Okay, we might want to identify that this is the reset state, but other than that, all the information that is contained in this state diagram, contained in those truth tables. So we don't even need the state diagram anymore. The truth tables tell us all the information that we need to know. So let's convert these truth tables to logic. But the key is, remember, I said that a state machine, that is all built around memory. What's in the memory? The states, right? In fact, let me go ahead and what we'll do is now identify the fact that we are moving to step five. And what is step five? Design the lot. Actually, step five. Yeah, step five. Design the logic, right? Something along those lines, right? Don't hold me to it. I don't know what number it was. Anyway, what we're looking at here is two truth tables, and they're all based on this memory. Now, how many bits do we have? We have two bits, S1, S0. What are we going to store those bits in? We're going to store them in flip-flops. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to just draw two flip-flops here. So I'm going to have my D input, my clock, and my Q output. So D input, clock, Q output. Now, one of the keys behind this system is that it's got a heartbeat or a clock. And that clock is just going to tick along. And every time it ticks, what it's doing is saying, are we going to the next state? Are we going to the next state? Remember that the, the, the values that are stored in there are the state. Now, where do we get access to the values stored inside one of these latches? Well, or these flip-flops? 
Well, they come out Q, right? So S1 and S0 are actually associated directly with the Q outputs of those D flip-flops, all right? Which means that coming into D, that's the state we're going to. That's what we're going to store inside of the flip-flops. So coming into the Ds, coming into the D that's connected to S1, that's S1 prime. Coming into the D that's connected to S0, that's S0 prime. And so this is the heart of our system, the memory. This is where our, our, our uh, current state is being stored. Now, going all the way to this output side, I have, well, I've got the six outputs, right? I'm gonna draw these six outputs. So this is red, north, south, yellow, north, south, green, north, south. And then we have red, east, west, oh, not red again. We're gonna have yellow, east, west, and then we're gonna have green, east, west, right? And this truth table right here is gonna identify exactly what the circuit is to go there. For example, we did this already. Red, north, south, it just simply follows S1 directly. So we just simply take S1 and connect it to red, north, south. Then yellow north south. Yellow north south is a one if S1 is a zero and S0 is a one. So what we've got going into the yellow north south is an and of, so it was S1 bar. So we take S1, run it into an inverter before it goes into the and gate, and then S0 goes straight in, all right? Green north south. Green north south is also going to be a product. It's going to be when S, S1 is a zero and S0 is a zero. So we have another AND gate here, and we take S1 bar, S0 bar. And so, so based on whatever our states are, these are the outputs. Those are those, the outputs for north south. Now east west. Red east west. Red east west is a one whenever S1 is a zero. So we're gonna have S1 coming down here, going through an inverter to the output red east west. Yellow east west. Yellow east west is simply the product of S1 and S0. So it's S1 ended with S0. And then green east-west is a one only when S1 is a one and S0 is a zero. So it becomes the product of S1 ended with S0 bar. And that's all there is to it. We've got our output generated just based on the current state. And remember, this is a more machine. The state, and the way I remember this, the state uh, it only... <laughs> Let's try this again. The way I remember this is, apparently not well, is that the output relies only, output only on the state. And that gives you the more, right? The two O's and more. All right, now let me make a little bit of room because in order to generate the next state logic, I need to make car now maps. Now, we're gonna need two Carnell maps, one that represents the logic for S1 prime, S1 prime, and one that generates the logic for S0 prime. So I'm gonna need two of these guys. I'm gonna need to have S1 prime, and it's gonna be an eight-celled Carnell map that is based on the inputs S1 and S0 and T. Now, we're gonna also need an S0 prime Carnell map All right, and it's also S1, S0, and T. Remember our gray code numbering. So we do 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0 for S1 and S0, and then T is gonna be zero or one. 
And then for the other one, the same thing, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, and t is 0 or 1. And converting this or transferring this, we've done this many times before in this, in this series, is we're going to simply take those patterns of 1s and zeros in the columns and put them in the cells of the car now map. So for 0, 0, for this top left-hand cell right here, that's S1 is a 0, S0 is a 0, T is a 0, that's the top row. S1 prime is a 0, S0 prime is a 0. This top right-hand cell, 0, 0, 1, the second row is 0 and a 1. So 0 for S1 prime, a 1 for S0 prime. This cell right here, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, I get a 1 for S1 prime, a 0 for S0 prime. This cell right here, it's the 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. I get a 0 for S1 prime and a 1 for S0 prime. This cell right here is for S1 is a 1, S0 is a 1, T is a 0. So we jump down to the seventh row where we have our next state is 0, 0. This cell right here, 1, 1, 1. That's the bottom row. Our next state is 1, 1. And then this cell right here, 1, 0, S1 is a 1, S0 is a 0, T is a 0. That brings us back up to the fifth row, the ones that we hopped over, and our next state is going to be 1, 1. And then the last cell, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, our sixth row, our next state is going to be 1, 0. All right. And now that we've got our Carnell maps, remember that the Carnell map is just a truth table reorganized so we can see how to simplify it for a sum of products expression. So now that I've got the Carnell maps, I don't need the truth table anymore and I'm going to erase it. Now it's time to make some rectangles, right? Well, the rectangles are not necessarily obvious here. We've got this one all by itself. Actually, they are obvious, but there's not really any very great, big, simplified uh, rectangles. We've got the one rectangle there. Then we have a pair sitting right here and another pair right here. All right. And then in our other rectangle or other Carnell map, we've got another one that's all by itself. Then we have a pair sitting right here and a pair sitting right here. All right. So let's go ahead and put these Carnell maps to good use and make some sum of products expressions out of them. First of all, let's look at S1 prime. Now, the S1 prime, both of these guys, they have three terms. They have three rectangles, right? One of the rectangles and both of them have just one cell in that rectangle, which means that the product that's going to be generated for that one cell is going to have all three inputs, S1, S0, and T. Two of the rectangles in both of these guys are of size two. They can encompass two cells. Because of that, one input's going to drop out of the product for each one of those rectangles. Let's go ahead and do that. And once again, if, you're, if you don't remember how to do the, use the Carnell maps in order to generate a sum of products expression, go back and look at the old sum of products expressions Carnell map uh, lessons earlier in this series. So start with this guy. That rectangle right there is a one whenever S1 is a zero, S0 is a one, and T is a zero. So that becomes S1 bar anded with S0 and with T bar. All right, so 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. Now we're going to or that with the product generated by this rectangle right here. That rectangle is going to be a 1 when S1 is a 1 and T is a 1. So that becomes S1 and with T. And then this rectangle right down here is going to be a 1 when S1 is a 1, S0 is a 0. So that becomes S1 S0 bar. All right. So there is our expression, which is going to drive what S1 prime is. Let's look at S0 prime. 
S0 prime is going to be a one for these three products. We'll start with the, the cell of size one. So this one right here is represented by the product when S1 is a one, S0 is a zero, and T is a zero. So this becomes S1 and it with S0 bar and it with T bar, right? Now, the top little two input rectangle right there. This guy is a one when S1 is a zero and T is a one. So this becomes S1 bar ended with T, all right? And then this rectangle right here, these two guys, they are a one when S, S0 is a one and T is a one. So this becomes S0 ended with T. And so there are expressions. Remember, we came from the state diagram to the truth table only by numbering the states. And then once we number the states, we could create our truth tables um, and then our Carnell maps in order to come up with these expressions. Now, if you look at these expressions, they are based on three inputs. They're based on the input T, right, which is our system input, but they're also based on the current state. Remember, we need to know what state we're in before we can know what state we're going to. So I have to actually take these two inputs, S1 and S0, and I need to bring them back as inputs to the circuitry that's gonna go there. That's an awful lot of circuitry to fit in that little space, but we'll see what we can do. All right, now, first of all, S1 prime is the OR of those three products. So there's gonna be three AND gates here. So one, two, three. All right, so it is the AND of S1 bar, S0, T bar. So S1 bar, S0, and T bar, all right? Ord with S1 ended with T, so S1 ended with T. Ord with S1, S0 bar, so ord with S1, S0 bar. All right. Now, S0 prime, that is also a sum of products expression. It is the OR of three products. So we've got one, two, three products. All right. S1, S0 bar, T bar. So S1, S0 bar, T bar. Ord with S1 bar T bar, or excuse me, S1 bar T. All right. Ord with S0 T. So Ord with S0 and T. All right. There it is. Now, I'd work through the logic for you, but let's just go ahead and just do a quick thing. Let Remember, if we're in state 0, 0, all right? State 0, 0. 0, 0 said that the red light, is, what, what do we have? Uh, 0, 0. So the red light for north-south is off. The yellow light for north-south is off. And the green light is on. That's zero, zero going into that NAND gate. And then a zero going through this inverter means that we have red east-west is on, yellow is zero, as is green east-west. So there's our outputs. But now the zero, zero come back and they are inputs here. The timer, if the timer is not running, then passing through all this logic says we need to stay in state zero, zero. And so if the clock pulses, it will keep storing zero, zero, as long as that timer is a zero. If, however, this timer turns to a one, meaning this, that a car has arrived and the timer has started, our next state, going passing through all this logic, is going to be zero, one. And as soon as I get a clock pulse, it's going to store zero, one in here, and everything is going to adapt to exactly how the system 
should react whenever a car approaches and the timer has started. So there's kind of a little, it turned into a little bit more complicated a state machine than I was hoping, but hopefully that process and the next state machines that we're going to go ahead and design will give you a better idea or a better feel for the whole process. In the next video, in the next lesson, what we're going to be talking about is just general theory uh, to show, okay, let, we've, we've gone through a state machine design. If I give you a general block diagram of a state machine, exactly what does, can you give me any information about how that state machine is working?